Good afternoon. My name is Brad Wolf, and I'm with Peace Action Network of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I have the pleasure of working with Dr. John Ruhr on a fascinating proposal he has put together about a peacekeeping mission in Ukraine, specifically in the Zaporizhia region. Welcome, doctor. How are you doing today? Thank you, Brad. It's good to be here this afternoon. Thank you. We appreciate it. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I am a retired emergency physician who got interested in conflict work after 30 years of treating people for what they did to each other and what they often do to themselves in terms of dealing poorly, violently with conflict. And so now I spend my time trying to figure out how we can stop uh, conflicts becoming destructive and help people get needs met without going to battle and to war. What did you observe in your recent travels to Ukraine? Well, a couple of things surprised me, Brad. First of all, people when I was in Kyiv and even in Odessa, just 100 miles from the front line, people were living quite normally. They were absolutely resolute in the determination to resist the invasion and preserve their lives and culture. They were really, really together in that. I was impressed by the community and their efforts to assist and help one another and the nonviolent resistance they displayed in the early weeks of the war. But spending time with refugees in Ukraine and Romania, uh, I was dismayed that all the history and experience that I thought Ukraine had was buried under a barrage of weapons that NATO nations sent and uh, that seemed to give them a sense that they could win this war, that it could be successful from a military point of view. Uh, at the beginning of the war, my colleagues at Physicians for Social Responsibility and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War were quite concerned about the possibility of disturbance at any one of Ukraine's 15 nuclear reactors. Ukraine, you know, is the home of Chernobyl, where through some faulty technical aspects, a uh, reactor blew up in 1987 and, and still has a contaminated area of 2,600 square kilometers where people can't safely live. Uh, the thought of repeating that maybe many times over with a war in Ukraine was very frightening. So I'd been following the International Atomic Energy Agency's attempts to inspect the plants to be see if see if they were safe. And when they finally got there in uh, September, uh, early September of this year, uh, and worked to stabilize all the safety systems, uh, their final word was, "We've got to stop the war around this plant. We cannot have combat near this plant. It is far too dangerous for the people of Ukraine, Russia, and much of Europe." And specifically, that's the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia you're referring to. Well, that's the plant that's had direct combat. Uh, there hasn't been uh, close combat around the other reactors, although there have been some uh, artillery attacks. It's uh, nothing like the dangers that Zaporizhia, which is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe with six uh, working reactors, uh, th that is, is in the greatest danger. Most of those reactors have been shut down now to make them safer, but there's still enormous amounts of radiologic material there that could cause a catastrophe. And who now occupies the area surrounding that plant, and, and how does that endanger the nuclear power plant? Well, the Russian military took occupation of the plant in early March, just a few weeks into the war. And they used that as a a stronghold that they know cannot be directly attacked. So the Ukrainians have accused them of, of hiding their artillery and bombing Ukrainian positions across the river from that plant, knowing that they can't safely fire back at the plant. But that hasn't stopped a lot of artillery shelling around the plant, which has broken the incoming power units that are necessary to keep that plant running safely. Can you tell us a little bit about this proposal you have for going back to Ukraine and specifically to that region? Well, the idea came to me when I was looking for ways that those of us who believe that war is obsolete, that war is far more problematic than most people think and leaves such trauma in its wake, uh, how can you keep things safe without that? And while I was there, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency proclaim publicly that the combat around the plan has to stop and that they need a demilitarized zone and said that he would begin working with, with both sides 
to create that demilitarized zone. That's been two months and it hasn't happened. So while I was reading this, I thought, wait a minute, 14 UN inspectors went of their own free will unarmed into Russian occupied Ukraine to check on the safety of that plant. They know nothing I'm guessing about what we call unarmed civilian protection or nonviolent action. And yet here they were doing it just out of the goodness of their humanity, trying to save all the people in the, the locale that would be killed or injured and whose lives would be ruined if a mishap happened at that plant. So I said, the least that those of us who are trained in unarmed protection methods could do is go in and support them in some way. And so we began to write up a plan of how that might happen. And uh, that was the inspiration was the people already doing this. And, and can you tell us what unarmed civilian protection is? Well, if you were like me, and I think most people are raised on the belief that, yeah, we try to get along, we try to do things without fighting. I was certainly raised in a home where uh, if somebody's bullying you, just walk away. It's their problem. Don't get into fights. Uh, but when somebody's really coming at you that's trying to hurt you, your best defense is, is in violence. And so most of the world is sold on the idea that you want the best warriors and the best weapons. Uh, the problem is uh, people aren't a, don't fully count the cost of, of using that violence in their defense. For example, like most Ukrainians uh, felt that they just have to win this war through military means now, they see no other clear option. Uh, and, and I don't blame them a bit for that because that's that's all they know. And it's all that seems like it would work. But if that plant goes up and kills tens of thousands of people or creates a huge area of Ukraine that can no longer be occupied, including a lot of those heavy industrial areas in the east, uh, uh, that's another cost that if you put in the, the whole equation about whether the war is worth executing, um, would, would could tip the balance uh, in, in favor of trying something else. So one of those something else is, is what unarmed civilian protection is. That is people determined to protect one another without the threat of violence. All over the world, there are at least 80 groups doing some form of this or another. And the power of it lies in the appeal to the common humanity and everyone, the and release of the energy and creativity that happens when one gives up the option to kill. If you take kill and war off the table, that huge amount of money and huge amount of brain power can figure out other ways to solve the conflict. Um, and it has, over the last 30, 40 years, developed a fairly sophisticated methodology that's being used by, like I say, over 80 groups. In this case, a protection team uh, to monitor a demilitarized zone around that plant could only go in with permission of both sides of the conflict. So that's the primary protection, is that just getting both sides to agree to that. We think it's possible because Right now, either side walking away from the plant and demilitarizing it leads to the possibility that the other military will take it. And that's seen as a defeat in the war situation. I mean, this is a great prize for the Russians. And even the International Atomic Agent, Energy Agency says, no, it's not Russian territory, it's, it's Ukrainian territory. So it's militarily occupied. But if both sides agree, okay, we'll let unarmed people, that almost a team would almost certainly have to include Ukrainians and, and Russians, along with a lot of internationals, uh, that's the that's the uh, that's the protection for the plant, and then the secondary protection comes from all the influences on the Russians and the Ukrainians from the outside. World opinion is huge in this. And so, are you looking for volunteers to join this effort? Um, absolutely, uh, we're trying to create a proposal that has enough credibility that the International Atomic Energy Agency and other agencies at the UN will say, hey, we like this idea. We're asking for demilitarized zone. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, let's use this piece to try to make that happen. And uh, so we need volunteers to do that. Uh, we have about 25 volunteers now. We probably need double or triple that. To do a great project, we would need many hundreds to, to really create the zone that the IAEA is asking for. Uh, but we can start if we have a certain critical mass uh, that uh, and a specific training regimen for them to make it look credible to the United Nations. And do those volunteers need to have experience in UCP or will training be made available to them? Well, like in a military conflict, the more training you have, the better you're going to do. So people with experience would be the, the uh, people that would probably be most helpful, but we would take anybody who has a proven 
a commitment to nonviolence and a proven ability to deal with very complex uh, conflictive situations. Uh, it can't be anyone off the street, clearly. It has to be somebody with, with experience or willingness to go through the specific trainings for UCP uh, to do the job properly. And for those who might be interested in pursuing this to get the training or who are already trained, who should they contact and how? Well, let me say just a few more words about the kind of training, uh, because most people aren't familiar with the methods of unarmed civilian protection. But it it involves things like situational awareness, always being aware of and trying to anticipate any untoward event that might happen. In other words, if you're afraid of being attacked, you don't sit there and wait to be attacked. You go out and reach out to the people that might attack you. You're always aware of what's going on in the surroundings. And in this case, it would probably be fairly sophisticated. You know, one of the problems with the combat around it is each side accuses the other, others, others of shelling. So having a lot of monitors with, with sufficient technology to say, hey, we know exactly where that shell came from uh, can help de diffuse the situation. Of course, we'd have to be trained in the local cultural awareness. We'd be dependent partly on the people that are already living there, how to get along and where to live and so forth. Um, conflict analysis and monitoring, de-escalation techniques, and, and relationship building with all the parties. And this would have to be at very high levels because the decisions to even allow us to do this would have to come probably from the top levels of government in both Ukraine and, and Russia. But it's very unique and it might be appealing to people who are looking uh, for a way out of this mess uh, without losing face and without and giving up what, what uh, they think is right. Um, we would have need additional training, which we hope we would get from the, the Atomic Energy Agency itself and radiation safety and how to handle uh, potential problems there, as well as experts in, in digital security, uh, instant communications and so forth. And, and what is your timeline? When are you looking for volunteers to reach out and contact you? Well, we need as many volunteers now as possible. People that say, hey, I can, within the next month or two, I can give a month or two of my life to this effort. And as soon as we have the critical number of theirs, that uh, we'll begin trainings. And then with those things in place, go to the International Atomic Energy Agency and other appropriate authorities and say, hey, we've got this. Can we help? And for those who are interested and can make that kind of commitment, uh, how would they contact you? Uh, right now, I'll be the primary contact uh, at uh, uh, jfreuwer at aol.com, or you can contact anyone at uh, World Beyond War who will refer back to me. World Beyond War will be a sponsor of this project. Wonderful. Sounds like a fascinating plan, very bold, and we wish you the best of luck. Do you have any concluding remarks you would like to share? Well, you know, a lot of people would consider this kind of thing pie in the sky uh, because they're so unfamiliar with doing anything in this manner. And uh, those of us who have been practicing unarmed civilian protection techniques for decades now know how effective it is on a small scale. And we really think it would be equally effective on a large scale. And this is a this is a way to step up the belief and, and show the world that there is something besides military strength that can that protect people perhaps in a better way than the military can. Thank you so much, John. We appreciate that and we appreciate you presenting the plan today. Thanks for having me, Brad. Take care.